Okay. So yeah, well, it's it's really uh um really was happy to do that. I mean, MSERT's been really invaluable for our research. And so I kind of like wanted to just give you an overview of of um where we are with protein design and then uh, since like, uh, and, and with protein interaction prediction, because that's, that was really in back in, uh, when we first started using Perlmutter, that's really what we were focused primarily on. And, um, I'll, I'll maybe comment a little on the sociology at the same time. Um, so, uh, so for many years, we developed sort of physically based models for protein structure prediction and design. Um, and that was all in the Rosetta software. And then, um, in the last uh, um, in the last four years or so, we've switched entirely to uh, development to um, uh, to deep learning methods, and and it's actually kind of a funny story, which you'll probably appreciate there. Which is, uh, you know, for many years uh, there were attempts to get Rosetta to run on GPUs, and like every three years, a graduate student would come in and want to rewrite Rosetta for the GPU, and it was just I, I don't know how many people years got lost. It's for that I, it's probably much more than I know because um, these people do they shouldn't tell me. So so I had a very negative opinion about GPUs. But then um, you know, we started doing this deep learning stuff. Of course, the GPUs are absolutely you know absolutely essential because you're just basically multiplying big matrices together. Um, but we didn't really have any. So I mean, so that's where um, so we we. Uh, uh, so having, you know, national resources with both CPUs and GPUs, I think is, I think a lot of people were in that situation, probably still are. Um, so, um, so let's see. Uh, so one of the things that has, um, been in the news a lot lately is, um, is AlphaFold 3. And, um, before we knew about AlphaFold 3, we were working on what's called, um, what we call Rosetta Fold All Atom. And, Basically, the idea of Rosetta Fold All Atom is uh, that you you take in whatever information what you, you take in the the composition of your biomolecular system, whether it's proteins, nucleic acids, small molecules, whatever, and uh, it goes into Rosetta Fold All Atom, and then um, it generates the structure of your complex. And uh, so, one of the challenges there was how do you represent uh, these different things? So you could represent amino acid sequence. And DNA sequence obviously as sequences, and then you could represent atoms as a bonded graph, and then um, uh, and then you ultimately produce a prediction. Um, and this is sort of what a trajectory looks like for um, this result to fold all atom. It'll eventually start folding around a ligand. Um, and uh, so what um, what we found um, when uh, doing this is that we could make uh, accurate predictions. Um, for small molecules, um, but but not all the time. And it was, you know, so it was it was exciting that we could throw in like protein, a protein sequence and a small molecule graph and get a prediction. Um, and um, but uh, but you know, we, you know, the, the, as far as we knew, this was the only way there was to do it. And then um uh then DeepMind and Isomorphic Labs it basically, so we put a our preprint on this online and then. Three weeks ago, they basically three weeks later, which was in the fall, they released a white paper saying that they were better. And then, um, but we didn't really know if they were going to describe what they were going to what they were doing. So we just kept going. And then uh, a few weeks ago, they released a paper. And basically, what the paper is mainly mainly about is about how they're better. But now they kind of really describe what they do. So it's 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 kind of neat. And um, uh, but they didn't release the code. So and you can't actually use AlphaFold three. To predict how small molecules bind to proteins, um, so this is kind of like an interesting thing where I think a lot of people have been saying it's why it's important that there be federally funded research uh, to develop these kind of models because they could you just you don't want like tech companies kind of like you know being the only ones who have access to powerful software. Um, so uh, there was also kind of a big big hubbub about the publication because their paper was published without. Uh, release of the code. And so that got into this whole question of, which I only learned about after the fact when I happened to pick up an issue of nature and read about this, but um, about whether journals should require um, code to be released. But I guess what I'll say is that that I think having federal, like one of the real limitations to developing computational methods is is compute power. And I think, you know, having a federal, having resources like NSERT to, 
to support this kind of work, I think is just super important. All right, so now I'm gonna um, talk about protein design. So we've been developing sort of a, a general pipeline for designing proteins with new functions that we start by given a problem, like design a binder to a certain cancer target. Um, uh, it, the first step is to generate protein structures, which uh, should be, uh, which are suitable for that function. And that we do using a method called RF diffusion. And then we assign sequences to that structure using protein MPNN. And then we use Rosetta fold or alpha fold uh, to see whether those, uh, those new sequences that we've designed actually do are predicted to fold up the way that um, we design them to. So this is basically the idea of, of um, RF diffusion. And um, so here we have, so um, I'll, I'll just, uh, since we don't have much time, let's go through. So we basically, we take all the protein structures in the PDB, uh, we noise them, and then we train, uh, we fine tune Rosetta fold to remove the noise. And we tell it what how much the structure had been noised. Um, and so then what you can do is you can start off with completely random noise and then keep applying it, applying this network, which has learned how to remove noise from noised uh, protein structures. And what happens when you do that is uh, you end up, you start with complete noises, the animation on the left, and you end up with something that looks like a reasonable protein structure. Well, over the last couple of years, we probably tested, you've tested many thousands of proteins in the lab generated in this way. And, this, and it, it really works extremely well. Um, I'll just show you some of the highlights. So, uh, we can condition this diffusion process by um, uh, by giving it, for example, a target. So this is a drug target in gray on the left here called the TNF receptor. It's the target of, of many of the drugs that are used to treat inflammatory disease like Humira and Enbrel and others. Um, and so basically, uh, and those are really expensive kind of antibody drugs. So we just started this diffusion process on the left here, sort of in the presence of this uh, target. And it and you see it, it kind of like assembles into uh, a protein which fits almost perfectly against the target. And uh, we can then sort of sort of repeat this noising and denoising process and um, end up with, with proteins that bind very, very tightly uh, to this uh, target. And there's other, there are many, actually it turns out, cancer targets in this family too. So we can, by applying this sort of noising, denoising strategy, we can make things that bind those as well. Um, there's a lot of interest in, in a, lot, a lot of the pharmaceutical industry is really uh, kind of based a lot on antibodies. So we can basically tell this diffusion process to not only make a binder, but make it into an make an antibody or an antibody binder. And this is a, a nanobody that's been diffused to bind to uh, the influenza hemagglutinin here. And that binds very, matches very closely to the, uh, to the computational model, the, uh, the experimental cryo-EM structure. Um, and we can uh, use this design process to make proteins that are very effective in um, actually in animals in in, in vivo models. Um, in this case, for for cancer, where um, uh, I won't really go through this, but this is a, a sort of kind of stringent cancer model in mice, and the the the, the mice that got this design protein um, uh, live a lot longer. Um, uh, than, than mice that don't. So we're kind of excited about design proteins as cancer therapeutics. Um, so we can also use this process to design proteins that bind to uh, flexible peptides. And so this is um, parathyroid hormone in pink here, and we can start this diffusion process around it and um, design proteins which, which bind to it quite tightly. Um, and uh, uh, on a more, uh, on a particularly interesting and important class of peptides are the ones that are involved in amyloid uh, disorders. And um, we've developed a pretty general strategy to make binders uh, to that class of proteins. And, uh, and it basically involves taking the, the peptide and putting it in the middle of a beta sheet that is, um, this is the design protein and this is the peptide. So this is A beta and this is tau, which have both been implicated in Alzheimer's disease. And um, we uh, those peptides, if you put them in solution, will aggregate, and that's what's measured on these axes here. Um, but if you add in the design protein, it basically kind of binds the monomer so it can't aggregate. And uh, so there's a pretty general way we think of blocking amyloid formation, and we're trying to um, test this out, out not now in, um, in animal models of the disease. 
Um, we can also make proteins that bind to disordered proteins in cells, which are which is interesting because there's been a lot of interest in, in disordered proteins recently, but it's been very hard to design proteins which can target them. Um, so uh, we can also use this, these processes to design uh, proteins which can span the, the span biological membranes and have pores in them. And so here are here are some design proteins. Uh, again, designed from scratch that have pores of increasing size, and those pores will conduct, conduct ionic currents. And so um, we can actually measure currents going through these pores here. The re these are inserting into a lipid bilayer, and so this is sort of the path of least resistance for ions going through. And um, we can design proteins at the surface of the pore that bind to a small molecule of interest, in this case, cholic acid. Um, and this just shows that we can design such proteins with really high accuracy. And um, what's neat is they become gated channels. So this now becomes a pore which whose, whose opening and closing depends on the presence of cholic acid. So this is the amount of current going through the channel without cholic acid. Then if cholic acid is added, you see that the, the pattern really changes. So we're pretty excited this as a, as a, as a, way, a general way of making sensors for different compounds. And we're even working now to couple this with electronics directly by having these proteins insert into silicon nitrate chips, which might sort of give, have some really interesting possibilities for the computing of the future. Um, so the, um, um, let me just get rid of this. Uh, so um, now I wanna talk a little bit about the design of protein nanomaterials. And um, so uh, my colleague, Neil King, uh, had sort of the real highlight here, which it was the design of um, the first de novo designed uh, medicine, which is a COVID vaccine, which was approved um, a couple of years ago for use in humans. Um, and since then, we've been thinking about how to design really large protein containers for, um, for example, for delivering um, cargos into, into cells or into the body. So it turns out that an icosahedron is the largest sort of symmetric, purely symmetric structure you can make. Um, and uh, after that, um, uh, you, you basically have, you have identical subunits, you either get a regular plane like a hexagonal lattice, or you can get uh, an icosahedron which has 60 subunits. Um, but uh, to make something larger, you have to break that symmetry. And we've been playing around with several different ways of breaking that symmetry. One is to include more than one type of building block when we create this cage. And the other is to use one type of building block, but have it adopt different conformations. And so we've been able now to make things which are much larger than an icosahedra um, by now going, this is a, a structure with four different building blocks. So now each building block is always in the same environment, but those environments uh, can be different because they're different building blocks. And so we can get away from this icosahedral structure is the largest uh, phenomenon. Um, and this sort of shows how we do it. We first make an icosahedron, and then we insert additional subunits in between the subunits of the icosahedron shown here. And this is a cryo-EM structure of one of these design large structures. And by comparison, this is the um, AAV um, virus particle, which is one of the mainstays of, of gene delivery, delivery currently. You can see there's a lot bigger um, we can also uh, have one subunit that we've now programmed to be able to break symmetry. And I think the easiest way to see this here is um, this uh, cryo-EM structure where we have some, um, some of these, you can see this is forming a pentagon. This is kind of like a soccer ball-like structure, but the protein here is always the same. So uh, this protein here is, um, you can see this ring here is, there's two hexagons and one pentagon. But this one here has, um, or this one here has, uh, it's a little hard for me to see actually here, but you'll see that the environments are different. Certainly these two arms are identical to this arm, but these two arms go, this arm goes between two hexagons and these arms go between a hexagon and a pentagon. So we've gotten the protein to be able to adopt two different states. Um, if you're not used to looking at proteins, you might've gotten that might have been a little frustrated by some of my earlier slides, but we've been trying to work on that too. So um, 
we've now been able to make proteins where building from them is almost as as easy as building with um, like pieces of lumber. So we can make these curved building blocks and these straight building blocks and make these sort of slanty interactions between building blocks. And then by putting them together, we can make structures like this. So this is a cube. It's sort of made in exactly the way that it's described here. Um, and then we can what we can do is just change the sides, the size of this um, this building block here, and we get four different size cubes. Um, they're all identical except for the number of, if you look, there are these yellow repeats, which is basically the number of copies of this. You can see it's 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 with it's basically zero here, a two here, four here, and six here. So that just expands the cube out. And and this these are um uh, EM structures again. We can also make nanomaterials that can switch between two different states. So this is a design that has four different subunits, but then an effector like a control molecule is added and it switches to having five different states, five, five different subunits. And you can see that goes from sort of this square shape to this pentagon shape. Um, and we can um, also design proteins which bind to DNA. So DNA has you know, this very regular structure and so we design proteins, these are DNA bases, and we design proteins that stick amino acids in to interact with those bases. Um, and in doing that, we can get very high um, specificity for particular DNA sequences. So we're sort of excited about this as kind of a new way of being able to uh, control the, all the things that DNA is involved with, both sort of directing which proteins get made, as well as um, being able to edit the genome for uh, gene therapy now with design systems. And this just shows we can take pairs of these design binding domains and connect them using RF diffusion in different orientations and spacings and combinations to make proteins that actually regulate transcription in cells in different ways. And then um, I wanted to show you where all the work that, um, that again, this, this, this work began um, on Perlmutter, uh, um, work, uh, how this all worked, how where this prediction of interactions worked out. And so where this is, uh, where what, what we've been doing recently on this project is to design protein, is to look for proteins, human proteins that are, are predicted to interact. So we basically make predictions for all pairs of proteins um, in the human proteome and see which ones are predicted to come together. And here's some examples of the, the, uh, of the new complexes um, that we have identified in this way. And um, uh, some of them have some really interesting uh, biological implications. Um, and uh, um, so I, I'm just, I'm not, I don't mean you to, to actually read what's on these slides, but I just wanna show you that kind of this kind of large scale discovery is turning up some very interesting new biological phenomena. So more generally, what we're doing at the Institute for Protein Design is, uh, trying to create proteins that solve modern challenges in medicine, technology, and sustainability. Um, so I'm, I've mainly talked about the medicine side, um, uh, but we're also really interested in the technology side. I showed you about, for example, those expandable materials. I mentioned the protein silicon devices. And then we're doing a lot of work now on um, artificial photosynthetic systems, on plastic degradation, and starting to sort of try and ex explore different routes to carbon sequestration. And really, um, you know, I think the the, the resources at, at NSERC have been really critical to uh, to enable us to develop the methods to sort of really explore this wide range of topics. Um, so I've had really um, amazing colleagues here, uh, and um, uh, I think um, in the interest of time, I'll just I'll just put this this up here, and um, uh, and maybe uh, instead be fun just to have a conversation or. Um, uh, or um, uh, uh, you can ask questions or whatever would be good. Okay, well, thank you, David, very much. Um, if you have questions, uh, I think we're in, I think we have a technology where you have to type them in to chat or, or in Q&A uh, for most of us, but I'll start with a few. Um, so thanks for the great talk. Now, the, the things you were describing today were mostly or completely enabled by using AI techniques. Um, everything I talked about today was enabled by, was essentially using AI techniques. Yeah, it's really been a complete change. If I had given a talk, you know, four years ago, there would have been, uh, you know, 
maybe or five years ago there would have been no AI, but it's completely um, yeah, it's completely taken over. So how how expensive um, <clears throat> are these calculations? I don't know if you can give some sense. Yeah. Of- well, you know, the really expensive thing is the uh, the training the models. Uh, the actual inference is um, the inference is still expensive, but the inference just scales with you know how many like for any given problem. Um, you know, typically depending on how hard the problem is, we will uh, do many make many designs. Um, so, uh, but so so the, the 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 inference part just depends on on how many you are, how many designs you want to make. But the training really is expensive. Um, these, these models are big. They have hundreds of millions of parameters. And it's um, particularly when you're exploring different architectures that there it's, it's really, it's, it's, it's a lot. Um, so what is the training sets? Well, you know, it's funny. The training set is, um, is almost, uh, is the PDB. I mean, and, and that's, you know, everyone's been, there's been all this, you know, buzz about the power of AI and biology and everything getting solved, but really it's because the, really the unsung hero is the protein structure database, which, you know, that start, you know, the first structures were solved in the sixties. And I think there's like, there's been so many scientists who put their careers into solving structures and, um, you know, a huge amount of money has been invested, many billions of dollars around the world. So you have this amazing data set, right, where you have many hundreds of thousands of structures where for each atom, you have its X, Y, and Z coordinates, and there might be 10,000 atoms. So the amount of high quality data is really incredible. So the real question is for other aspects of biology, you know, will AI have the similar type of revolution? Or, you know, I think it'll first require data sets that are as, you know, on that scale. Um, Yeah. So we've got some questions. Uh, let's see the first one. Do these AI techniques have any accounting for molecular entropy? Is it implicitly built into the model? Yeah, it is an interesting way. So, um, so one of the problems we always had with Rosetta when we were predicting structure is we would, um, uh, or, or um, let's say, yeah, both for predicting and designing structure is we could compute energies because that's what, you know, we'd sum up all the van der Waals interactions and electrostatic interactions. So we'd compute energies, but there was no way of knowing whether, so you could look for particularly low energy states, um, but you didn't really know whether you couldn't see the landscape. So, you know, you didn't really, so they weren't free energies. There might've been another state. So the actual stability, the entry, you didn't really know what the entropy was or the entropy loss would have been. So the um, the deep learning model models are sort of parameterized in terms of probability. Um, so what you're you always think about with the with, is sort of the likelihood of something. Or so you can you can take a sequence and ask what the most probable confirmation for that sequence is, and that implicitly sort of considers the whole landscape. And so you're not computing entropies exactly, but um, but there is a sense in which the the deep learning model. Is essentially it's essentially getting the partition function. It's like you know it's it's essentially when you get a probability when you're learning a probability it actually is more global than learning an energy. Okay, thanks. That might have been a little this obscure. Is, but. <laughs> the next question, uh, Chris says, it's a novice question, but once you've designed a protein in this method, how hard is it to synthesize it for looking at it through something like cryovm? Oh, that's a really good question. Yeah, I skipped over that. I'm sorry. So. Um, uh, so basically, you you run uh, you you say you want to design a binder to um, uh, to a, a cancer target or a new virus like you know H five N one is um, uh, is you know racing through the world. So you basically run the diffusion calculation I showed um, in the presence of the viral protein or whatever the target, and then you uh, then you get your designed sequence. Once you have your designed amino acid sequence, you um, you uh, order a piece of DNA, basically a synthetic gene. So there won't be any gene that already exists to um, that encodes your protein because it's brand new. So instead, you have to you have to make a piece of DNA or buy a piece of DNA that encodes your protein, and then uh, you go into the lab. When you get it, you go into the lab and basically add it to bacteria or yeast cells who just take up the DNA, and then they start producing the protein. Um, and then uh, you can 
uh, get the protein out pretty quickly. So one of the things that's happened in parallel with the, the whole this whole deep learning uh, advances we've been making is we've also really sped up the speed with which we can um, test design. So it's kind of remarkable. Uh, and also DNA synthesis companies have been getting better and better. So it's gotten to the point now where you could be you could be a graduate student coming in, new graduate student at the University of Washington, where you come in and first couple of weeks you learn how to do design proteins. Next couple of weeks you um, uh, you uh, you design binders to to some target you've picked. Then when you're ready, you can order um, you can basically have 96 sequences, completely different sequences for each of your designs. Uh, you can send those to a company. And then the company will send you back a 96 well plate with the synthetic piece of DNA that encode each of those 96 proteins. And when it works well, it takes about, it takes less than a week. And now we have approaches where you can take that plate with your 96 genes in it and have 96 proteins in about three days later. I know because I did it myself. <laughs> it was, I, I, uh, uh, I designed my own proteins and, and made them and tested them. And it's just amazing how fast everything can go now. Great. Cool. Okay. Well, I think maybe one last question uh, from Wenbing is, thanks for the great work. I uh, was curious about the training costs. Does this work um, using E3 models? Does this work using E3 models by any chance? And if yes, what are LMAX and typically used in this domain? Let's see. Um, I'm not sure. So um, I'm not sure what are E3 maps? Okay. Ask the... Uh, Ask the person who asked to. Uh, to uh, yeah, well, I'll just say generally, this is this. These codes are all in PyTorch, so they're just using Py PyTorch tensor um, manipulations. They're running on GPUs, and so it's pretty standard stuff. What makes what makes the models uh, time consuming to train is there. There are many many layers, so you end up, like I said, with hundreds of millions of parameters. But there's nothing that the 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 um, you know, it's very standard uh, neural network architecture with transformers attention. You're just basically multiplying large matrices together. Okay. And actually, I know I missed one in another window here. So this is going to be the last one is, does the machine learning avoid structures known to be toxic to cells? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, we, um, uh, the, 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 the proteins that come out of this tend to be very specific. They're small. And they're very, they have these interaction sites, but they're really, as I showed you, kind of custom built for their target. So they tend not to interact with anything else. So we haven't found any proteins yet. We've put many, many proteins into cells and a reasonable number into animals. And we haven't come across anything that's toxic, except there's one place where we see things that are toxic. Like for, um, you know, there's a lot of interest right now in cancer immunotherapy, where the idea is you have cancer and the therapy is to amp up your immune system. And a known problem there is that the immune system can be too activated and cause damage somewhere else. So with some of our designs that are aimed in that direction, we see that we do see some toxicity. It's what's called on-target toxicity. It's all, it's sort of, it's exactly what's expected for something with that function. But we haven't seen any kind of really weird, strange responses to design, de novo design proteins. Okay, well, thank you. Um very much for the talk and all right yeah well thank you and thank you for all your help all your support okay well okay. Uh, thanks okay, okay. bye, bye.